only uh, nine months ago, and here we are. So last time it was exploring, discovering, and uh, this time we have the, the opportunity to, uh, to share um, a, few, uh, a few insights. <coughs> um, that's the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and a disclaimer, uh, we prepared it together, and uh, Lara especially, I'm the one delivering, so that's not gender friendly, <laughs> but uh, there is a big generation of behind, uh, she would be the one taking the lead for potential uh, continuity in terms of co-creation um, uh, over the next couple of years, and, uh, and uh, she will be active also in uh, the common discussion later on and to answer your question. Um, so what we wrote actually, and uh, uh, Vilte, she mentioned that we had um, explored some techniques of co-creation inspired from social and, uh, and, uh, and service and policy design. And we did, and we would be happy to share about it because I think that technique is also uh, the uh, technology of involvement, of engagement with people are very, very relevant and it's part of our, of our experience. But since we had only 20, about 25 minutes to present, um, uh, we wanted to focus on one specific aspect of our experience, which is um, uh, how um, design can contribute uh, to interpreting modernist heritage, uh, to, interpret to interpretation of modernist heritage at least in two sense, in two meaning. Uh, one, which is uh, how you interpret a piece of music when you are a musician, uh, it exists often, prior to your interpretation, that you, the, you create ownership and engagement with this piece of music because you interpret it, you put this emotional dimension into it, and uh, this allows to, uh, to make it alive and uh, to create these continuities and why that was uh, uh, actually mentioned. And then interpretation is what uh, brings us together today, uh, which is uh, transmitting, communicating knowledge, sharing experience, uh, with people who are more or less knowledgeable about what you are sharing, especially when it is, it is a piece of heritage. So we take, uh, we took these two uh, meanings. Um, basically, who we are, we are, um, uh, we are where we live, actually, and we live there, and we work there. And uh, this is a big piece of modernist architecture, of post-war modernist architecture. That's one of the five housing units uh, built by uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, that's the first one. And that's the only one that actually materialized his ideal of a radiant city, of vertical city. Uh, that's the only one, although there are four others, uh, 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 three in France and uh, one in Berlin. Uh, but that one materializes uh, because uh, there are several public parts in this vertical building, which is uh, mostly devoted to housing. <coughs> this is one of the two uh, shop street, main street. So you have shops, you have different services, uh, a hotel, a restaurant. Uh, you have a public school over there, on eighth floor, and on the rooftop, uh, you have uh, um, like a center for doing some gym and uh, now yoga exercise, whatever. Uh, you have also pillars down with a public space down those pillars. Um, so this is a full experience of, uh, of collective living, of living in general, but also of interpretation because it is a UNESCO listed building since 2016, uh, a French listed building since uh, uh, 1985. And uh, it is visited, uh, it is still home to 1,200 people, 337 flats and about 60,000 visitors a year. So uh, we had this experience of interpretation mm -hmm. as tenants, as owners, as professionals working in it every day, every single day of the year because it's open uh, all the year uh, round. So this is something we live very much in. We were not here by mistake. We came there because we had already an experience and work uh, dealing with interpreting modernism from design and especially from the design scenes of Central, Baltic, and Eastern Europe that we found the most uh, uh, triggering and with the most untold stories like the one of Kaunas or little told stories about modernist heritage. So we basically came there to create a space and to live also, uh, to create a space for uh, designers and artists from uh, Central Eastern Europe to come and to show their work 
related to modernist aesthetics. That was uh, how it uh, unfolded. So basically what we do is uh, we, uh, uh, organize, we create exhibition, we create selection of objects from designers from uh, this uh, region, including the Baltics. Uh, these are examples of exhibition, one in Paris about uh, Czechoslovak uh, crafted baubos of functionalist furniture. That one uh, 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 is uh, about Polish uh, contemporary artists dealing <coughs> with the modernist aesthetic of the 1950s. Uh, in this case, uh, that one was interesting. Uh, it was um, uh, uh, in December and, uh, of last year and January of this year. And it was our first collaboration with Baltic countries, uh, with the Estonian Design House. And it was combining contemporary design, partly inspired by uh, interwar um, modernist furniture, and uh, an exhibition of original uh, interwar furniture uh, in Plywood. It was a good example of what we do, actually. What was the, in the untold story there? It was that Estonians invented Plywood. Plywood was, of, was one of the favorite material for interwar furniture and, as you know, post-war IKEA furniture in general. But they invented it. They brought it to Britain. Uh, by bringing this furniture, this type of material, to Britain, at the same time, they brought an opportunity for British people who were lagging behind in terms of connection to a, a modern uh, architecture movement to get involved uh, in Bauhaus and functionalist <coughs> style and to build the first ever Bauhaus building in the UK, in London, the Isaacon building, with money from Estonia. Mm -hmm. So it was the, basically one of the internal story we wanted to uh, present. This is uh, our latest event before today, uh, which was in September in, no, not latest actually, <laughs> the one before, uh, in September in Tallinn. And here it's also uh, kind of uh, giving a good example of what we do. We brought another uh, story, which is the story of interpretation of Polish modernism from design to uh, a different context, Estonia. In Poland, as we will see, modernism is really important for the contemporary scene. It's actually key. It's part of uh, the vernacular uh, uh, contemporary culture. Um, and it's a big issue to preserve pre-war and post-war modernist buildings. Estonia is a very different context. Uh, Post-war modernism especially is connected with the Soviet occupation, so there is a bad image of it, uh, and uh, it <coughs> creates a lot of empty, uh, non-lived space, spaces across the cities because they are connected to this period. But at the same time, people still live there and use it for different purposes, but they are not interpreted because they are just forgot about. So it was important to share this type of experience. But what we wanted um, especially to to do today with you is, uh, and uh, to bring also for the afternoon discussion, is uh, to share two case studies that we think are relevant for the different questions that have been raised. How to create emotional engagement, how to connect uh, people who live in modernist heritage buildings uh, with people from outside, from within the city, within the country, or from uh, foreign countries in the perspective of 2022. Um, the first case is closer to you, um, to Kaunas, uh, in terms of period. That's the Czechoslovak case. Um, and, and how uh, uh, modernism is interpreted uh, uh, in Czech Republic and Slovakia nowadays. What makes this connection with Kaunas is uh, this connection between architecture and state building. Kaunas was built as a new capital city. Uh, and uh, architecture meant something in this context, modernity meant something in this context. The same happened uh, in Czechoslovakia at the very same period after World War I. Uh, it was a matter of modernity and statehood to uh, uh, put forward uh, modern architectural style. It was not modernism or functionalism, which is a local word for modernism in Czech uh, context, that was put uh, for what first. Uh, it was Cubism mm. that came from uh, the uh, 1910s, so before the independence, and that was translated into a new style very quickly called um, Rondo Cubism. Cubism in architecture is specific to Czechoslovakia, it never existed elsewhere. Rondo Cubism is specific to Czech mind. Mm. They are the only people in the world that can connect <laughs> round and square without any uh, 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 you know, uh, schizophrenic syndrome. So, 
they used a lot uh, this uh, Blondo cubism in the first year of their independence, where the first building of modernist canvas were built, uh, were erected, uh, for uh, uh, new temples, because the new state needed in the Czech mind a new religion. So no longer the typical Catholicism coming from the Austro-Hungarian period, but a new form of Christianity, much more connected to paganism, and for instance, crematoria was, were very important in this period. And uh, Czech people, by the way, still nowadays burn corpses after death uh, by 90%. Nobody is buried nearly in the country. So this is a pavilion actress realization uh, from 1921 in Pardubice uh, mm -hmm. in this style. And this is a, uh, you needed also new uh, institutions like this public bank from the legend of Czechoslovak soldiers. Uh, also in Rondo Cubism, and this is currently now, uh, it was also uh, put in a lot of detail of art craft, and it is reinterpreted like in this very modern and trend-setting publication uh, so far. But quickly they move to functionalism, the local version of what we could call here modern uh, pre-war modernism, and it was connected to the nature and identity of the country, because I think it's important to share first what is the connection of people to this architecture historically to understand how they can interpret it right now? <coughs> so that's why it's important to introduce that. Uh, so it was connected to industry because Czech, Czechoslovakia was a very industrial country and still is. Uh, so there were a lot of big companies like Batia Shoes and uh, Batia that built in the south of the country a 28 stories modernist building in 1928, uh, a sky. Uh, a sky uh, Cracker, one of the first of the of the country. Uh, there were a lot of public institutions to be built, uh, uh, like the Nar uh, National uh, Museum uh, of Modern Art, uh, built for this purpose in 1928, uh, 1929, and uh, uh, in a pure uh, functionalist style. And Corbusier actually came to oversee the, the works because he was so impressed of how they mastered the con uh, concrete construction and it was one of his inspiration. Mm -hmm. Again, you need new temple. That reminds you of something? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, and there were a lot of churches built by the master of the cubist, then Rondo cubism, then functionalist art architecture, because basically, at the beginning, there were the very same people. Pavel Yanak, Josef Gochar, Jan Kotira, all trained uh, 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 in the same uh, uh, places and uh, having worked together and close in terms of generation. It was a very connected country to international uh, trends, and that was also important uh, to mix with domestic ones. Uh, well acclaimed architects like uh, Adolf, Adolf Luz, Miss van der Rohe, uh, with the Chicken Art Villa in Brno, uh, and Mark Stamm as well from uh, the Netherlands, uh, built uh, a, a couple of villas in Prague as well before moving uh, uh, to experiment in the Soviet Union. All these uh, world-class uh, architects came uh, to Czech Republic because actually there were people in the vanguard, in the industry, to commission those work. Mm -hmm. And those people, there were few uh, across uh, Europe. Um, but there were also a lot of uh, domestic masters, like Slav Fuchs and, La and uh, 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 Heina Kucherova, a woman as well. And uh, they, uh, brought, they were brought together in a big uh, uh, consortium uh, that led built in the 20s and 30s the Baba uh, uh, neighborhood uh, close to downtown Prague. So it's uh, currently in the sixth district uh, with tons of functionalist villas still existing and by a lot of international and local uh, masters. So this was very much. Uh, the identity of the country in the interwar period. Modernity, vanguard, uh, a bit of paganism, industry, and connection uh, to, to the world. And democracy as well, as a political system which was uh, quite uncommon uh, already in the 30s in Central Eastern Europe. Um, so this is a picture, and this is what people recall from this period. It's a very, very positive one. It is called the First Republic, and First Republic, per Republic in Czech, it's a positive adjective. It just means fine arts, modernity, and vanguard. Also today, also for people who were born after 1990, it is a very uh, vernacular uh, concept which influences uh, this current interpretation. 
Example of interpretation starts also with uh, already with cubism and with low cubism. So uh, this is translated in contemporary design. It is very much present in modern architectures. This is a contemporary villa in Czech, uh, totally inspired from uh, functionalism. Uh, a rip, uh, it's a rupture, a disruption with uh, a post postmodern uh, kitsch style from the 1990s and 2000s. It's getting back to the essence. A lot of mixture between pre-war and post-war uh, related furniture, also uh, 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 shaping uh, the context of modern uh, uh, living. You have a, a lot of uh, interpretation work also in publication. You have spaces like the Kafka uh, uh, bookstore in a uh, publishing house, but you have like tens of those places across the country uh, publishing about local trends of modernist architecture and creating also spaces for people to come and uh, for workshops and for venue sessions, which are extremely popular as, uh, as that one. Uh, functionalism and modernism are also very much present uh, in contemporary projects. This used to be a modernist power plant in downtown Prague that has, turned, uh, has been turned last year into uh, the latest kino, cinema, venue, Edison, because it was an electric power plant. Uh, so Edison with uh, related functionalist furniture, and that's one of the new places where people actually gather uh, in Prague. Cinema was extremely important. It was uh, one of the main uh, cinema uh, producing countries over the 30s. Uh, the big apparent of studio were built in functionalist town in 1932. They are still functioning, and they are still the third largest uh, cinema studios after Babelsberg and Hollywood in the world and a lot of production are dealing with this period, especially Czech production. And so it's very also uh, into the pop culture. This is a functionalist villa featuring in a Roma TV show that was released a, a couple of years ago. And it is basically uh, an ubiquitous uh, architecture and interior style that you can see across the country, uh, that you can see in a lot of exhibitions dealing with the 30s, that you can see on the uh, front cover of uh, uh, trend setting magazine. It is something which is extremely present and uh, positively related. Slovakia is different. I will be brief on it, but uh, uh, in Slovakia, the first Republic interwar period is also very positive, but it is beaten in terms of positivity <laughs> by another one, uh, which is uh, the 60s, the 1960s and 70s corresponding to the federalization of the country, so more power going to Slovakia, uh, but also uh, to uh, opening to uh, Western-style consumerism for a short period of time be before Soviet invasion in 68, and uh, also to leaving the countryside and finally entering into modernity much after the Czech part of the country. Therefore, what is reinterpreted there, from design and photography as well, is post-war modernism. Uh, from, especially from the 60s and 70s. Uh, in graphic design, it's much present as a building of the radio, which is sort of a totem for uh, contemporary uh, Slovak designers and consumers as well. This is a building of the public radio, still existing. Maybe you remember, you've seen these pictures uh, with uh, swimming ladies, by Maria Švarbová, they are now work, she's a world academy photographer, has a Black Master to Arts 2018. We will be happy to welcome her for an exhibition devoted to uh, 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 our building next year. And she's uh, uh, someone who is uh, contributing to diffuse this uh, 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 aesthetics on a world scale, because she's doing exhibition in Asia, in China, in Taipei, in the US, uh, and across Europe, and also Latin America. And, uh, uh, and she's working a lot about buildings from her own country, uh, Slovakia. So different type of uh, interpretation <coughs> from the design. I'm going to the second uh, case study, which is as much interesting as the first one, although it is a bit more remote from Kauna's case uh, 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 from a uh, uh, historical uh, perspective, not geographical, obviously, which is a pop interpretation of Polish modernism. Again, we have this connection between architecture and state building. In the case of Poland, yet, it is more a question of state rebuilding, because we know the case of Poland, yeah, the country appears, disappears, appears, disappears, translates, moves from the borders, are never the same. 
uh, and it was completely erased from the map uh, uh, during World War II, so it is more about the construction. The connection was as, as much straightforward as it was in Kaunas in the 20s and uh, early 30s, uh, because in this, in this time, although it was not a fully full French democracy, but more authoritarian state, there was also a question of rupture with the Catholic Church, uh, building a modern state, a modern statehood, and architecture has a role to play in that. And Bauhaus and early functionalism and modernism were the preferred style for this endeavor. But it, it is, was more concentrated in a few big cities, Warsaw, Krakow to a lesser extent, and um, uh, uh, then uh, it was, uh, for instance, in, the Czech, uh, in, the, in Czechoslovakia. Uh, this is our picture from the uh, Jolie Borch colony uh, in, uh, in Warsaw, which is, has been left intact by World War II. That's the only place. Uh, and you, you can still visit with tens and tens of modernist buildings, which were home to the creative community in the 20s, which are home to the creative community in the 2020s. So it's, uh, it's still functioning in, in that way. But it's quite a, uh, a small experiment. But the main question for Polish uh, uh, architecture and statehood was posed after World War II. The country was destroyed. The country has been moved uh, 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 to, uh, to, to the West. And uh, the question, the dilemma of this phoenix reinventing country was threefold. To restore, mm -hmm. that means to rebuild identically, to preserve uh, relation to the roots of the country and of its statehood, Everything here is fake, okay, it's from the 1950s, and this you have in all uh, uh, big uh, cities like Gdansk and Poznan and Wrocław. Uh, importing, it was, much not, it was not a matter of choice, you had to import Soviet architecture, and uh, if you did not want to, then the Soviet just brought it as a gift. <laughs> and this was a big gift, uh, the Pekin, the Palace Nauki Akuturi, uh, uh, Akuturi Anauki in uh, the center of Warsaw. That was, there were a lot of jokes during communist time about it, and the main one was uh, Warsaw is beautiful only from one uh, perspective, from the Pekin, because you don't see it. <laughs> and that was long uh, the relationship of uh, Warsawians to this place, but as you can see in this modern reinterpretation, that's no longer the case. That's a trademark of the city. And without it, Warsaw is not Warsaw. Uh, so that uh, shows the, the change. Um, so this was a po immediate post-war uh, dilemma, restoring, uh, importing, or reconstructing. And reconstructing, repenting with a new style, which was post-war international modernism. And this is a postcard from not so an happy time. There is this uh, memory of Poland as a very dark country, which is also shared by the Poles themselves. But the 60s, the early 70s are an exception. A lot of loans from the West allowed to access some sort of consumerism. Mm -hmm. And the city was enlightened by neons. And it was a little bit less unhappy. Dancing, uh, neons, as shown here in the Museum of Neons of Warsaw, that were disseminated across the country. Everything was dark, but the architecture was bright. And the neons were lightning in the sky at, at night. Uh, actually, if you see the uh, movie uh, uh, um, Ida by Pavel uh, Pavlikovsky, uh, you have uh, a very dark picture, a motion picture. And in the middle, in a key moment of the movie, she's, in a, the, like, she's a novice uh, and she's in a dancing. And this dancing is a modernist building from the 60s. And there is a live rock music with electric guitar and alcohol and those little cups as uh, that one that you've seen uh, are in the movies. And it's a moment of, you know, hesitation between modernity and backwardness. She chooses backwardness, that's the problem of the movie. Uh, you have like large mo 